We have a busy presentation today. Uh, we're honored to have uh, two presenters, Thomas Van Hee, partner at Aura for Middle East Tax Consultancy and affiliate professor of tax law, as well as Niles Van Hassel, counsel at Aura for Middle East Tax Consultancy. And again, one of the topics that uh, was brought to us again by Baker Botts is what are these VAT issues in the defense sector? And I know as many of us have uh, learned more about VAT, not only in the UAE and Saudi Arabia, there are complexities around that. And so today's uh, session should be very valuable. Uh, we will make this recording available as well as the slides available to DSMC members after uh, this presentation today. With that, I'd like to turn it over to Thomas uh, for an introduction of his firm and to jump into the presentation. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Mar uh, Matthew. Sorry, <laughs> I was going to refer to Mark uh, to thank him for uh, having uh, introduced ourselves uh, to, to the DMCC. It's good to see a number of familiar faces as well in, in, in this group. And I think this, this group is very valuable uh, in the sense of uh, the exchange of information that can take place in, in, a, in a confidential setting. Um, us as a firm, we're, we're heavily active in the defense sector, uh, which has its own specificities and, and is a really good uh, sector to, to work in, but has a number of particularities which uh, we feel uh, are good to sum up uh, as part of this, uh, this webinar. Um, perhaps as well, uh, in terms of the timing for today's webinar, uh, we'll be uh, trying to close off around 2.45 uh, with respect to the contents, and then we'll leave the floor to, to the Q&A that Matthew was, uh, um, uh, was mentioning. Um, Today's um, uh, webinar is focusing um, solely on, on VAT. Obviously, there's a number of, of uh, associated issues uh, because uh, perhaps not necessarily for the, for the UAE, but for example, for, for Saudi, but also for, uh, for Amman and the other GCC countries, uh, there's also an application of direct tax which could uh, interlink or interfere with, uh, with the application. Um, for the UAE and, and Bahrain specifically as well, there's uh, economic substance regulations, which require you to have substance in, in those countries where, where you're active. Uh, so those also we, we have not uh, tackled, um, although they could be a very interesting topic perhaps for our next, uh, for our next uh, working group. Um, in terms of the, uh, let me try and see if I can, uh, okay, there you go, that works. Uh, these are just our pictures, but you see the people in front of you. We've uh, left our time at home uh, today. Matthew already did uh, our in introductions. Um, in terms of the agenda, um, as said, the Q&A will come at the end. Uh, Nils will introduce the topic by setting the scene of it and looking at where we are in terms of the implementation of that in, in, in the region, which is a novelty for the, uh, for the region which is not a global novelty of the CDM because around 160 countries in the world have a VAT system uh, or something similar to that. We're still waiting for the US to, to introduce a, a VAT system and then we can all move there uh, perhaps. Um, and he is, he'll also touch upon a number of important provisions and then um, identify a number of issues that we've uh, encountered. I think one of the interesting elements of, of today's webinar as well is going to be uh, us sharing some use cases for files that we've worked on for the last uh, three years. Obviously, those have been, uh, let's say, any resemblance to actual uh, circumstances is purely coincidental. And we've made sure to uh, change facts, either uh, the countries of the uh, companies that are supplying certain uh, goods or services, uh, or otherwise, uh, also the countries in which they are active. Uh, so. We try to make it recognizable uh, in terms of the issues, but not recognizable in terms of the companies associated uh, with this. So um, without further ado, I'll, I'll hand over to, to Nils, who's going to uh, kick off the technical part of the presentation. Yes, thank you very much, Thomas, and also Matthew for hosting us today. And good afternoon to everyone joining in. My name is uh, Nils van Hassel, as Matthew mentioned, and I'm counsel at Orpher Middle East. Um, before we jump into the issues that we wanted to discuss today, we thought it might be useful to have a closer look at the status of the implementation of VAT in the GCC. So as most of you will know, 
the Emirates and KSA, they introduced VAT in January 2018. Since that time, there's been a few amendments to the VAT legislation in both jurisdictions. And I would have to say to a larger extent in KSA than in the UAE. And in addition to that, there's also been a lot of administrative guidance that was published by the tax authorities, both in KSA and in the UAE. Perhaps the most important development in the in recent times is the unexpected policy decision made by KSA last year uh, in May, to be exact, where they decided to increase the VAT rate from 5% to 15%. And this would affect from the 1st of July, 2020. So this increase obviously had a huge impact on consumers, but also for businesses, um, especially those who are exempt from VAT. Uh, for those companies, the VAT effectively becomes a cost as they cannot recover it. The same thing is also true for non-resident businesses, non-resident suppliers, for example, which are not registered for VAT in KSA and are incurring local VAT in Saudi. At the moment, there is no possibility for those types of companies to recover VAT, local VAT in Saudi. This may, however, be possible in the future once a refund scheme will be implemented. There are also transitional rules under which uh, businesses can continue to charge 5%, provided that certain conditions are met. And obviously there, it's key to ensure that all the requirements are effectively met. And we'll have a closer look at these transitional provisions later on in the webinar. Um, the UAE and KSA were then closely followed by Bahrain, if we have a look at, at the map again on the slide. And so Bahrain implemented VAT one year later on 1st of January, 2019. And just like its counterparts in the UAE and in KSA, the NBR, the National Bureau of Revenue, has been fairly active in publishing administrative guidance to aid taxpayers in meeting their obligations. And then about six months ago, Oman announced that it would also implement VAT. At the moment, there's a, a phased registration process going on over there. And Oman has also recently published its executive regulations. VAT will officially be implemented next month in the Sultanate. All signs point toward Qatar as the next GCC country which will implement VAT. And there's indeed some indications there behind the scenes which hint at a potential implementation early next year, although official sources are yet to confirm at this point. And finally, uh, we have Kuwait where due to ongoing political discussions, there's currently no clear timeline in terms of when or even if Kuwait will implement VAT um, after all. If we can go to the next slide. So in the next section, we will briefly discuss a number of important provisions in the GCC VAT framework. And this will help our viewers to better understand the issues that we will talk about later on in the webinar. So first of all, we have um, a customs exemption for supplies of certain military goods. Um, it's important to remember that it applies only to imports um, made uh, by the military and internal security forces. And it relates to uh, imports of ammunition, arms, equipment, military means of transports and parts thereof, as well as any other materials. Um, if you look in the GCC Common Customs Law, it mentions that um, a resolution is required by the authorized authority in the GCC member state. But in practice, we see that the different countries work on the basis of an ad hoc, ad hoc certification system. Secondly, there's also the VAT exemption on the imports of military goods. What's interesting about this provision is that it's rooted on the customs exemption. So to the extent that goods are exempt from customs duties, they will also be exempt from VAT. In terms of our third bullet point, it should be noted that as a general rule, the importer of record is required to be the actual owner of the goods. However, in practice, we see that this is not always the case, especially when we're dealing with long or complex supply chains, or where it concerns a supply of goods with installation, for example, or where there's an inspection of conformity done by the client after the ownership is transferred. Luckily, we see that in practice, um, there's a certain relaxation in this regard, especially in Saudi, where even if the importer of record is not the actual owner, input fat recovery is still granted by Gazette. Now the VAT exemption that we were talking about earlier, it's not only um, applicable to imports, uh, it's only applicable to imports rather. So any local supplies which are made in KSA or in the UAE, those will in principle be subject to VAT. Uh, 
Further, the VAT legislation also provides for a right to reclaim VAT for certain governmental organizations. Um, there, it's important to note that it applies to both foreign governments, but also local uh, government entities. However, at this stage, uh, there's no refund mechanism yet implemented for those local government entities to the extent that they are incurring local VAT. So that's an important aspect perhaps to consider when you're dealing with uh, those local government entities. Then there's also international treaties that come into play. Um, it's possible that certain GCC member states enter into international treaties with foreign jurisdictions. And those could, for example, state that VAT does not apply. Now, in practice, we see that this often leads to difficult discussions with the local tax authorities, that is, as it is a matter of international law, which then overrides the local VAT legislation. We also saw a case in practice where a local government declared in a letter of award that any supplies which were made under the contract would be exempt from tax. Now, that usually, again, leads to very difficult situations in practice as the VAT legislation would, in principle, override such contractual agreements. And then finally, uh, the GCC VAT agreement also contains provisions which, which states that supplies related to the supply of international means of transport would be zero rated. Now, in practice, um, it's unsure whether, for example, repair services or maintenance services would also be covered under uh, the scope of that uh, zero rate. And that is something that would have to be looked at in further detail. Next slide, please. So on this slide, um, we provided a breakdown of what is typically supplied as part of a defense contract and the implications for VAT purposes. Um, so any materials that are supplies, th those would generally be considered as a supply of goods, which are subject to different place of supply rules compared to services. Usually for goods, you will look at the physical location or the physical movement of the goods to determine the place of supply for VAT purposes. Everything which does not qualify as a good, which is usually anything that's intangible, that qualifies as a service for VAT purposes. So for example, we see here on the slide, trainings, technical assistance, any transfer of technology or the like, that would generally qualify as a service. Now, trainings in particular are a special case because they are subject to what we call a special place of supply rule. They are generally located where the training is actually conducted. So if, for example, a training is conducted in KSA, then this particular component of the supply will in principle be subject to KSA fact. The last two examples that we've mentioned here in the table, the technical assistance and the transfer of technology, there the place of supply will depend on the status of the client. If it is B2B, which entails that the client is actually registered for VAT purposes, then the supply will be considered to take place where the client is located. If on the other hand, we're qualifying it as a B2G supply, which means, for example, that a certain government entity is not registered for that purposes, then the place of supply will be where the supplier is located. So you can see here that the status of the recipient will determine the place of supply and therefore also the VAT treatment of those supplies. And then finally, we're focusing on place of supply rules on this uh, slide, but we've mentioned also in the top right that we also have to take into account the potential application of the zero rate. There, for example, depending on where your client is located, certain services could also be zero rated. The next slide, please. And here on this slide, we will have a closer look at the transitional provisions which relate to the increase in the VAT rate that uh, I was talking about earlier. And broadly speaking, there are three important dates uh, to take into account here. So first of all, we have 11th of May, which is the date on which the increase was announced or published. Then we have the 1st of July, 2020. And this is the date on which the increase entered into effect. And then finally, I marked here 30th of June, 2021 as another important date because this marks the end of the transitional regime. So let's go through the different situations that we've listed here on the slide and let's see what the implications are in terms of the transitional provisions. So in the first situation, 
The contract is signed before the 11th of May, 2020. The invoice is also issued before the 1st of July. And equally so, the supplies are carried out before the 1st of July. So in this case, we see that there's no issue in terms of applying the 5% VAT rate because everything takes place before the increase entered into force. Now, in the second situation, the contract is signed before the 11th of May. Invoice is issued before the 1st of July, but this time the supplies are carried out after the 1st of July, 2020. And here, the transitional rules state that the 5% VAT rate can be applied until the earliest of the three dates that we've listed here in this column, which is either the date of expiry of the contract, the date of the renewal of the contract, or the 30th of June, 2021, which marks the end of the transitional regime. In the third situation, the contract is signed after 11th of May, but before 20 June, 2020, the invoice is also issued before that date. Equally so, the supplies are also carried out before the 1st of July, and we see that the 5% VAT rate can be applied, again, because the supplies have already been made before the uh, increase entered into force. The fourth situation, again, the contract is signed after 11th of May, but before 30th June 2020. The invoice is issued after the 1st of July, so after the date of implementation, but supplies are carried out before 1st of July 2020. And again, here we see there's no issue in terms of applying the 5% because the supplies have already been made. And then finally, the most risky situation, we say that for the last, um, here the contract is signed and the invoice is issued after 11th of May 2020. Um, however, the supplies are carried out only after the 1st of July 2020. In this situation, it's presumed that you're trying to avoid the increased VAT rate by invoicing before the supplies were carried out. And therefore, the transitional rules state that the supplier will be required to invoice an additional 10% of VAT in such a case. So to summarize, um, our recommendation would be whenever you are dealing with or applying these transitional rules, make sure that all the conditions are met. So let's now jump into a few of the VAT issues that we've identified. Um, we'll go over to them one, uh, one by one, and then Thomas, uh, when we hand over to Thomas, he will go into a few use cases um, of these issues. So we talked before about the customs and VET exemption for imports of military goods. Um, there it's important to note that the scope is fairly limited. So first of all, it only applies to imports and they need to be done by the military itself. So as mentioned also, it often requires in practice a certification letter in order to effectively claim the exemption. Furthermore, there's no exemption as mentioned for domestic supplies. So any local supplies to, for example, the Ministry of Defense, those will not be uh, exempt and will be subject to VAT. Um, by way of reference, also in other jurisdictions, um, oftentimes uh, supplies which are made to NATO or SHAPE, they, those will be zero rated. Um, however, as mentioned in the slide as well here, the exemption or rather the zero rate only applies to the final stage of the supply and does not usually extend to subcontracting. However, by comparison, such an exemption is much broader than what we're dealing with here in the GCC. As regards VAT clauses, um, what we see in practice is that prices are usually inclusive or silent on VAT. And this could potentially be a risk as a supplier, as you may end up bearing the costs of the VAT and you will have to get it out of your uh, price, uh, which was agreed with uh, the buyer. The fact that prices are inclusive stems from the fact that governmental institutions are not taxable persons uh, for VAT, uh, which entails that under normal, normal circumstances, VAT will be a cost for those entities as they cannot recover it. Sometimes we also see a contradiction in contracts um, where it states that, for example, customs duties and VAT are for the account of the buyer. But at the same time, it includes, for example, a provision which states that all taxes, which includes customs duties and VAT, will be for the account of the seller. So there's a contradicting allocation of who bears the tax burden in this case. 
Um, given the fact that VAT is in principle recoverable for the importer of records or potentially exempt when the import is done by the military, there is no need to allocate this cost in, in such contracts. Another note also on contracts is that in our experience, uh, amending existing contracts can be quite difficult. Um, however, sometimes it's necessary, especially with respect to long-term contracts, which predate the implementation of VAT and which are usually silenced in terms of VAT. And ideally, such contracts would include clauses which also go beyond the mere stipulation of whether the agreed prices are inclusive or exclusive of VAT. So our, if, if we can go to the next slide. So our focus today is on VAT, as Thomas mentioned, but uh, we also wanted to include a word of caution on the link between corporate income tax and withholding tax, uh, specifically in relation to KSA. Um, it's likely that defense contracts will result in a foreign supplier having a permanent establishment in a GCC state, for example, in KSA. Um, any profits which are attributable to the PE will in principle be subject to corporate income tax, which is taxed or levied rather at 20% under a deduction of any allowable deductions. Now, to the extent that there is no permanent establishment, any payments which are outbound, as we call it, so payments from a resident to a non-resident, um, those would be subject to withholding tax, where again, you have to assess um, is the payer effectively withholding the correct amount? Is he applying the correct withholding tax rate? And finally, it's also likely that there's going to be a divergence between, on the one hand, the profits attributed to a permanent establishment and also the amounts which are reported for VAT purposes. And to a certain extent, this is normal because, of course, corporate income tax and VAT are based on different principles. However, it does add to the overall complexity uh, of such contracts. Next slide, please. And perhaps a word on offsets. Um, as a general note, offsets are usually present in, in almost all GCC uh, defense contracts. Um, what are the implications in terms of VAT or direct tax? So first of all, it has the effect of making principal contracts more complicated. And almost always they will result in the applicability of local VAT. Secondly, in terms of direct tax, offsets are likely to result in foreign companies having a PE uh, in GCC, as I mentioned uh, before. And finally, offsets often lead to complex or long supply chains, if you can go to the next slide. And these long supply chains they may lead to certain intermediate parties which are involved in supply chain being required to get registered for VAT purposes locally. So we've, we've had a quick recap now of the issues that we have identified in practice in, in our experience at Orifer. Um, so let's now have a look at a few use case cases which uh, Thomas will discuss in more detail. Sure, thank you very much, Niels. And uh, I appreciate that for a lot of you, maybe the uh, the wording and, and the, the statements are, are a bit technical. Uh, unfortunately, that's a bit how taxation works. Um, but I'm hoping to, to, to um, give a few examples of, of cases that we uh, ran into. And we'll start off, let's say, a bit in, 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 uh, with some easy ones to then go into more difficult ones. Uh, the first one is obviously, Nils was uh, mentioning the transitional provisions applicable uh, for the increase of VAT rates from 5 to 15. In Saudi, um, uh, there's an obvious uh, issue with contracts which are uh, VAT inclusive or uh, which are silent on VAT uh, to recover the additional uh, 10% which applies on, on the domestic supplies. Um, obviously, this is a bit subject to negotiation as well. If the Ministry of Defense is happy to pay an additional 10% in, in Saudi, then uh, that's a good thing. Uh, but obviously, if, uh, if there is no further negotiation and no further communication, then it is simply up to the supplier to absorb the additional 10%. And that obviously hits your uh, bottom line directly. Um, another fairly uh, easy example as well is how to calculate the tax basis. So a number of the contracts foresee that you need to recharge 
certain cost elements, be that salaries or uh, plane tickets, accommodation, uh, and a, a markup. And uh, you might be inclined to say, well, salaries don't have any VAT, so if I recharge salaries, then that should not be subject to VAT. That's unfortunately not the case. Um, the, the salaries which constitute the cost basis for a company which is then recharging those salaries needs to charge VAT on those salaries. In the exact same way as, as market big boss and us, uh, we pay salaries to our employees and we charge time to our uh, customers. Um, so even though you might be specifying this on a line item basis separately, uh, VAT still applies on the overall uh, uh, price. Going into a bit more uh, uh, complicated uh, issues, um, we have an example in front of you of a French manufacturer of uh, vehicles, uh, which has concluded a contract with the Ministry of Defense in, in, in Saudi. Um, as part of the contract, the French manufacturer of the uh, vehicles uh, is required to have local manufacturing. Um, as part of that local manufacturing, uh, the French uh, defense contractor has asked a uh, local provider to assemble a number of vehicles uh, on its behalf. Now, how this is structured is uh, the parts of the vehicles are uh, imported by the Ministry of Defense, uh, which is at that point not the owner of the goods, uh, which is claiming the customs and VAT exemption, but it's actually not the owner. So that might be a slight, uh, slight hiccup. Provides the parts to the subcontractor. At that point, the, part, the parts are still the uh, ownership of the manufacturer. The um, assembly uh, happens in Saudi, and then subsequently the um, vehicles are sold when in Saudi. Um, the French manufacturer is making a domestic supply in Saudi for the vessels which have been assembled uh, in Saudi, even though the parts uh, of the vehicles have been imported by, uh, by the Ministry of Defense. Additionally, as part of the contract, the French manufacturer has had to open a representative office in, in Saudi. The representative office doesn't intervene in the actual supply, but is more acting as a liaison with the Ministry of Defense. This is one of those examples where Niels was saying there could be a substantial difference between the reporting for VAT purposes and the reporting for uh, direct tax uh, purposes. So that's just one uh, example. Another one of a complex uh, supply chain could be um, equally so a, a Swedish uh, manufacturer uh, is supplying goods to a, a Swedish company, uh, which has a contract with the Ministry of Defense, um, but the, the uh, goods are actually bought from a subcontractor in Saudi. The subcontractor in Saudi makes its supply to the manufacturer, domestic supply in Saudi to the Swedish company, the Swedish company, the manufacturer, sells them to company C, which is a non-resident company. As a result of that sale, manufacturer A, Swedish company, non-resident in uh, Saudi, has to register for VAT purposes in uh, Saudi in order to make that sale subject to uh, VAT. Equally so for company C, since it is providing a domestic supply in Saudi to a non-registered entity, has to register for VAT purposes there as well. So this is the, shows you the importance of structuring um, a, the prime contract with the subcontractors. It may trigger uh, substantial additional VAT uh, registrations throughout the chain. Another uh, complex uh, supply chain, this time we took uh, Germany and uh, KSA. Uh, obviously KSA is, has a larger defense budget, so um, we have more cases in, in KSA than in UAE, but we'll show you an example as well for the UAE in, in a bit. This is an example of a uh, delivery plan which was interrupted by COVID-19, and it meant that the Saudi subcontractor could produce less vessels than foreseen. So we have a manufacturer in Germany and a subcontractor in Saudi. The manufacturer in Germany has, uh, has made sure that the subcontractor uh, has uh, the necessary knowledge to produce the exact same vessels as those which are produced in, uh, in Germany. The ones that are produced in Germany are imported by the KSA Ministry of Defense and are already the ownership uh, of the Saudi Ministry of Defense. So therefore, Saudi Ministry of Defense can apply the import VAT exemption and customs exemption, whereas for the locally produced uh, vessels by the subcontractor, they sell to the German manufacturer 
the German manufacturer then sells to um, the Saudi MOD. Now, along the uh, execution of the project, um, uh, we come to the conclusion that there's certain interruptions in, in, in Saudi. The subcontractor cannot deliver the 50 vessels as promised. <clears throat> the German manufacturer says, no issue, we're going to speed up production. Uh, as part of the contract, we're, we will be supplying 75 vessels instead of 25 in the overall uh, commitment to deliver uh, 100. Now, how that impacts your uh, initial uh, billing and your final billing is, on the left-hand side, you see your initial delivery plan, where you've got half of your uh, vessels, uh, which are going to be delivered outside of the scope, no VAT on it, and half of them subject to, uh, to VAT. Uh, we've taken a value for each vessel of two. So initially, the plan is to de deliver 50 vessels produced in Germany for a value of 100 outside of the scope of VAT, and 50 vessels produced in PSA for an equal value of 100 subject to 15% Saudi VAT. Overall contract value is assumed to be inclusive of that uh, here, so 215. So when the first milestone is invoiced to advance payment for, for in this assumption, 50% of, of the value, we're not applying 15% uh, on 100, but we're applying 15% on 50, half of the uh, value of the contract. And then we're doing the same value again uh, when uh, the final payment is there. I've obviously simplified the supply chain to, uh, to a great extent. However, due to the interruptions, we need to go to a changed delivery plan. And instead of having 50 vessels outside of the scope, we now have 75, which means that the proportions of VAT in the overall contract, they change. However, I've already applied um, uh, 7.5 on my initial invoice of 100, and I need to correct that. So as a way of correcting this, uh, uh, for the initial milestone, I need to now issue a credit note for uh, the difference in, in VAT in order to match the VAT, which is finally due, uh, which is 75% uh, of the uh, uh, of the 15% on 100, which should have been applied. I hope you're still following. The main message is in, in terms of the execution of the delivery plan, there could be impacts on previous milestones or previous advance payments which have uh, been made. Um, that is in respect of, maybe just going back quickly, that is in respect of prices which, which are, or contract values which are priced uh, plus uh, VAT. If you've got a contract value inclusive of VAT, the fact that there's less VAT due on the overall contract actually is in the benefit of the uh, contractor uh, because if a price is VAT inclusive, you get to keep uh, the difference. An important matter as well that we work on uh, quite a bit is what is the difference between a representative office and, and a branch? Now, I'm sure that uh, Mark from Baker Botson and his colleagues can, can elaborate more on the corporate law aspects of, of such a setup. Uh, broadly speaking, for, for our purposes, from, from a, a tax point of view, a representative office does not have any, any own revenue for tax purposes, whereas a branch does. And um, the rep office is an area of focus of uh, the tax authorities because often assumed as to be uh, concealing, hiding uh, certain commercial activities. Whereas the branch, on the other hand, is assumed to have a commercial activity. And sometimes you're a bit torn as a contractor between what legal form to choose and you end up choosing a branch for what is in effect rep office and then that comes with a whole host of associated issues where the tax authority is going to assume that you're actually uh, conducting a commercial activity because a branch also needs to have uh, financial statements, at least in, in, in Saudi, uh, also in the UAE, depending on, on where it is located, uh, but is also subject to any withholding taxes for payments made from uh, Saudi. Withholding taxes, which obviously do not apply in, <coughs> in the UAE. Um, I'm almost at the end of my uh, use cases, so I think I'm going to make Matthew very happy in terms of finishing on, uh, on time. Um, another uh, very often uh, issue confronted, uh, obviously because there are often requirements to set up a, a local branch, either uh, because the contracting entity requires it to do so, or maybe just because commercially uh, it makes sense. 
In a number of these cases, the local branch might not be involved uh, in the actual supply under the contract. Uh, and that's something which is, which is completely fine. Uh, from a VAT point of view, uh, there's a criteria on which we need to uh, analyze, which is which one is the most closely connected to the supply? Is it the branch or is it the head office? And accordingly, it's going to be either the branch or the head office that has the obligations for uh, VAT purposes. Uh, so there could be VAT obligations for the head office and which in a Kafkaesque uh, way then turn into uh, when the supply is actually made, the fat number of the branch has to be used in order to bill uh, the supplies to the, uh, to the government entity. Additionally, what is important is um, in terms of the uh, refund for non-established entities that Mills was referring to, which is active in the UAE, uh, active in Bahrain, and unfortunately not active in, in, in Saudi, which is a very uh, major issue uh, because we're seeing the contract subject to 15% now uh, subject to, to the refund procedures which have not been implemented. Um, if you do have a branch locally, then uh, you cannot benefit from the scheme for the, for the refund to a foreign entity. Um, so it's more of an issue in uh, UAE and Bahrain. It's less of an issue in Saudi, simply because the, the tax authorities have not given such a type of refund yet. So that's something to consider because if you do have a, a, a branch in Saudi and the branch is VAT registered, you can uh, claim your refund uh, for the VAT on any expenses uh, through uh, that branch. Obviously, again, as well, uh, branches, they constitute um, uh, taxable entities. Therefore, uh, from a CFT perspective, from a corporate income tax perspective, uh, you, you will have a, a PE risk. In order to put that a bit into a nice drawing, this time I use uh, the UAE uh, with a uh, UAE branch of, a, uh, of an American head office. When uh, goods are delivered and a contract is signed with the MOD by the US head office, the branch is not involved whatsoever and the um, MOD imports and the import exemption for VAT purposes, customs purposes can be claimed. Um, it is a bit of a different story when, the, uh, sub, when there's a subcontractor involved in the UAE makes a local delivery of goods in the UAE subject to 5% VAT. Uh, when uh, that delivery goes through the U.S. head office, U.S. head office has a UAE uh, branch and makes a domestic supply in the UAE, then the VAT number of the UAE branch of the American head office needs to be used, whereas the address of the U.S. head office is going to be mentioned on the invoice. It may seem a, a, lot, of, um, a lot of paperwork, a lot of formalities, uh, however, uh, it's necessary to, to comply with these uh, because on, uh, on the receiving end, uh, whether your client is a uh, business, they need to have a valid tax invoice, or whether it's MOD, they also need to justify the expenses that they're, uh, that they're making. And in view of the refund, which is uh, locally available uh, for government entities, they also need a uh, compliant uh, invoice. Um, over uh, to you, Matthew. Thomas, thank you very much. Uh, it, a very, very informative uh, presentation and, and many questions have come across here by email and uh, we have a number of questions uh, regarding, I think, the setup. Your last slide uh, actually goes to one of our first questions. Uh, you highlighted uh, the direct nature of the uh, sales to MOD, uh, in this case uh, from the USA. Uh, and the question is around joint ventures. Uh, how would a joint venture between a U.S. company and a UAE company uh, impact uh, that model uh, with regard to VAT? Yeah, it's a, it's a very good question because um, in, in the UAE, the case is relatively clear uh, for uh, contractual joint ventures. So unincorporated ones, they can register for VAT purposes. Um, in that sense, the, the joint venture can make domestic supplies. Uh, the major issue with joint ventures, which are not incorporated, is that they uh, usually cannot get a, a, an importer code, so they cannot import for themselves. But obviously, to the extent that the client is importing MOD uh, or uh, the naval forces or any, um, uh, any other institution, that would not be an, be an issue. Uh, 
the JV can register for VAT purposes and can recover input VAT as a normal uh, taxpayer. And uh, the, the follow-up question to that uh, is, would those services uh, then be uh, after sales services be applicable if they went through the joint venture or would it be preferred that it goes directly again in this model from the US to the MOD for VAT purposes? Yeah, so um, it's going to depend a bit on the type of services. Um, as Nils was mentioning before, for training services, those would be uh, always, uh, uh, UAE VAT would always apply on those. So irrespective of whether they're uh, charged by the uh, joint venture or by the US, uh, that would not matter. UAE VAT would apply to it. Uh, in that sense, it might be better to lead those services through the JV because otherwise you might trigger a VAT registration for the US company in the UAE. Oh, I think you're on mute. Yeah. The, there was another question regarding uh, the announcement by KSA for a regional headquarters being required. Uh, and how will this impact uh, large defense OEMs that already have uh, invested in regional headquarters in the UAE? Will they be required, uh, in your opinion, to have both? And then how would it impact uh, the VAT implications uh, of, of programs that are already being sold uh, directly, uh, in, in this case, uh, from a European country, uh, to an MOD that had a rep office in the UAE, but uh, the direct sale was going to KSA. And that rep set, the rep office was doing the business development. Sure. Yeah. Um, at this point, we're not aware of the specifics of Program HQ in terms of what will be required uh, in order to make your HQ in, in, in Saudi. Uh, what we know is from the public statements, which, uh, which recently by the Minister of, of uh, Commerce, I think, uh, said that it will not suffice to simply put a nameplate there. Uh, uh, there needs to be decisions made in Saudi as well. From a VAT point of view, that's not necessarily going to be uh, a, a massive impact. Um, the, the VAT is more of a substance over form uh, tax. Uh, so um, you, can, you can perfectly label uh, your Dubai entity and your Riyadh entity as, as headquarters. That will not change anything. Uh, from a direct tax point of view, uh, shifting functions uh, to uh, Saudi will also trigger a, a more heavy taxation in, in Saudi. Uh, so I think that's that's something to um, to take into account there. Uh, I do want to mention there as well uh, two more things, which is um, um, the use of free zones in Saudi. So uh, we now finally know the legislative framework of the first uh, free zone in Saudi, the ILBZ on, on King Khalid Airport. It's not extremely useful for the, for the defense sector, um, but the um, legislative framework can be a blueprint for future other uh, free zones as well. So that's something that to, to, to look into. Um, the other question that I, I just want to anticipate as well uh, already, which might come is, will there be a VAT rate increase in the UAE or not? Uh, and then will there be an introduction of corporate income tax in the UAE or not? Um, I, uh, let's say, we don't have a crystal ball, obviously. Um, going by the statements from the Ministry of Finance, they said, as from 2018, no more um, tax reforms for five years. We actually had two uh, since then. Um, but we do expect that around 2023, uh, we can see either a VAT rate increase uh, or, and or uh, the introduction of corporate income tax in the UAE at a fairly... Um, low rates. Um, Saudi also by that token has said that uh, once the pandemic is over, it may uh, consider reducing the VAT rate again. And obviously all of those changes, uh, they introduce complexity because we also have, always have transitional provisions and, and, and uh, you know, these things are, are good for consultants, but maybe not that good for business, I would say. A tax cut then we're, we're, we'll be hoping for is what I'm hearing. Um, another question, uh, and, and this I think goes to uh, really the offset slide that you had on slide 15, uh, if you wanna bring that up. Um, the, the question is uh, regarding the localization of manufacturing. So the emphasis by uh, groups like Tawazun uh, 
uh, Sammy, Gammy, and others has been to localize production uh, to take advantage of offset, offset guidelines, uh, both in the UAE and emerging offset guidelines in KSA. Uh, oftentimes, Tawazun uh, may be an investor in those localized uh, projects, and Sammy and Gammy are looking at similar models in Saudi Arabia. Uh, the question then uh, comes, how would VAT be applied if you have a government uh, shareholder in a localized company for manufacturing? Yeah. So do you want to take that yeah. one? Or, yeah. Ah, okay, sorry. <laughs> um, the, the introduction in the shareholder, uh, uh, as a shareholder in a UAE or KSC company uh, will not impact the, the uh, application of VAT. On that company, uh, so that's completely irrelevant from uh, from that perspective. Um, uh, equally, so the source of funding for that company uh, will be uh, will be irrelevant. Um, obviously, in in terms of, uh, I guess the message here is, the more uh, local content or local investment that is required, the more important that uh, VAT becomes. Because you cannot simply limit yourself to producing in the U.S., France, Germany, Sweden, uh, and, and just export from those countries uh, to the UAE. But obviously, I, I, I appreciate that's a bit self-evident uh, the, the statement that we're making. But it just kind of shows that the contractual provisions in those contracts uh, they need to be double-checked, uh, as opposed to pre-2018, where you know all of those elements were were a bit less important. So we have time for just a couple more questions uh, and a reminder to those that have sent in questions, uh, if you do not get a response, we will encourage you to uh, get a direct contact after this event uh, to follow up on your uh, concerns. Um, an additional uh, requirement uh, you highlighted in your German example, uh, if you could pull up your German slide, uh, I think 23. Uh, oh, the, um, this one, yeah. 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 And so the, the clarification question is uh, on the final payment, uh, you show a contract value uh, on the left side and then a final payment in contract value on the right side. Uh, can you just explain that delta between the contract values? Yeah. So the, the delta is triggered by the fact that the uh, production of the vessels has changed. So on, on the left-hand side, in the initial delivery plan, We've got 100 vessels of which half are produced in Germany, half are produced in uh, KSA. Production in KSA triggers application of VAT uh, from the German manufacturers to Saudi MOD. So 15% applies on 100. So overall, I've got 200 worth of uh, vessels and 15 of VAT, so 215. If I have two payments, and each are for half of all of these uh, supplies. Um, then I've got one first payment for 100 plus seven and a half, and a final, final payment for 100 plus 7.5. If you look at that in terms of what you will show on the invoice, you'll have two lines. You'll have a line which says 50 vessels, advanced payment, uh, uh, produced in Germany, no VAT, 50 vessels, uh, vessels advanced payment, uh, produced in KSA, application of VAT 7.5. So that brings you to the 107.5. In the scenario of the disruption due to the due to whatever external circumstance, I need to reduce the um, the overall application of, of VAT because in the end I'm only producing 25 vessels each for a value of two in Saudi. So I'm up to um, uh, 50. And uh, application of 15% VAT on 50 is uh, 7.5. 7.5 divided by 2 is 3.75. So when I look at what I should have applied on the first invoice, should have been 3.75 and not 7.5. Therefore, I issue a credit note uh, for uh, the difference. Thomas, we have uh, one more question and because we're uh, uh, very limited on time. Uh, the last question, uh, I'd like you to also uh, give you the last word. Um, so the last question is you've provided a number of use cases and a number of examples. Uh, 
Um, and what is your best advice to mitigating uh, what is becoming a, a much more risky uh, opportunity as, as defense spending in the Middle East remains strong and has increased 25% where around the world it has actually decreased, uh, it's still a very profitable uh, business case uh, for large OEMs um, and small and medium-sized uh, companies to come to the Middle East. But how do they best mitigate uh, this risk um, and uh, look at submitting a proposal that is value-oriented uh, and price-sensitive uh, while also uh, looking at risk mitigation. And then please tell people how they can get in touch with you directly and I'll wrap it up at the end. Sure, yeah. Uh, to answer that, that, that last bit, you see our contacts on, on this uh, slide. In terms of the uh, and anticipating and, and, and you, know, you, you want to offer the best price and, and, and if, if indeed in that best price, you've calculated that on 200, it's going to be 15 VAT and the VM is seven and a half, maybe uh, you, you might potentially be losing out on, on, on the project simply because uh, you priced it too, too high. Um, it's not easy to give a clear cut answer to that. Um, the, the, the answer should always be um, trying to plan ahead. So that before the, the negotiation of the contract, try and at least have already a, a, um, an idea of what the uh, what the different milestones are going to look like, how the delivery is going to be constructed, where the assembly or production is going to be uh, done, what elements are there in the contract? Is there technical assistance? Is there training and, and, and so on? Um, once you've mapped that, uh, you try and, and uh, qualify that for VAT purposes, and probably you should also foresee a bit of a of, uh, leeway. Um, uh, in, in, in just in case that the plans change and there might be a slightly higher uh, taxation applicable. The other thing is obviously also uh, during, we've seen a number of contracts where we thought um, the uh, MOD is not going to want to renegotiate, uh, whereas they, they did. Uh, they were happy to pay an additional uh, sum of, of VAT. So that was, that was very welcome, uh, but I don't expect that to be possible in, uh, in all cases. In, in part, also, it's a bit of a, of a legal question. Are there changes of circumstances due to an additional application of, of, a, of a higher VAT rate or an introduction of corporate income tax, for example? Those are, are important elements. Well, we uh, more recently also are, are inclined to do is, for some of the clients who want to look at, at a bit further down the line, the horizon of a few years, uh, we look, for example, for the UAE at what would be the impact of, the, of an introduction of, of corporate income tax, um, which is surprisingly enough, not always a negative, uh, negative impact. Um, I appreciate that's not a, that's not a clear cut answer to, no, to I, your I, question. I think Thomas, with the time that uh, we have today, it's been an enormous amount of uh, new information uh, and very helpful to our members. So I, I would like to thank Orifer, uh, Niels, Thomas, thank you very much for a wonderful presentation today. Uh, and thank you to Baker Bots for hosting uh, today's uh, working group and would like to remind all of our DSMC members uh, tomorrow's uh, working group is centered around research and development. Our presenter tomorrow will be Dr. Steve Griffiths. I encourage all of you who have not yet registered, please do so. There will be an incredible amount of new information around the R&D sector in the UAE and the, the uh, GCC when it comes to uh, defense and aerospace projects. And also a reminder uh, that we are uh, looking uh, and uh, submitting uh, or asking our members to submit white papers uh, to the uh, new conference that will be centered around industrial participation taking place at uh, this year's Dubai Air Show in November 2021. Again, with that, I would like to thank Orifer, Niels, Thomas. Thank you very much again. Thank you to all of our DSMC members uh, for your time today. Uh, it's wonderful to see you all. Stay safe, stay well, stay strong. Maslam.